This is Jim Sawyer for CapitalismandCrisis.org. Grandpa, our newest zombie character, reflects on the Industrial Revolution and its impact across generations of his family with Georgie, as Grandma was known to those who loved her. They grew up friends following the Civil War, about the time of the driving of the Golden Spike, that joined steel rails from the east with rails from the west from San Francisco's Bay Area at a historic connecting point near Promontory at the tip of the Great Salt Lake. The year was 1869. A locomotive in Grandpa's childhood might hit top speeds of 60 miles per hour, but before his birth, westward penetration by locomotives was limited. Coast-to-coast travel took six weeks by schooner around the tip of Argentina. Remarkably, however, by the time young Charles began school, a stunning development in transcontinental travel had already been celebrated. The driving of the Golden Spike by California Governor Leland Stanford meant a six-week sea voyage could be shortened to less than four days by transcontinental rail. Only four days! Then a single generation later, Grandpa's daughter Melba, who loathed the name Georgie had chosen for her, began her schooling. By then, autos were displacing steam trains, first as transportation upstarts, and then soon as dots multiplying along an exploding transcontinental highway system. Indeed, Henry Ford's mass-produced Model T signaled this new technology leap. The Second Industrial Revolution was underway. Next, only one generation following Melba, her daughter, Helen, raised her kids in a way unimaginable at the time of the Golden Spike. The new technology leap was the microcomputer, followed soon after by the Internet, which together heralded the Industrial Revolution's third phase. Still later, now actually, Helen's grandkids and Charles and Georgie's great-great-grandchildren are growing up amid the fourth great technology leap, signified by self-driving cars and a whole lot more. Not unlike the three prior phases of the Industrial Revolution, again, wrenching displacement is just around the corner. A symptom will be obsolescence of work as we have known it, and growing plight of myriads of workers like coal miners whose skills no longer are demanded robustly. Economists call this outcome productivity improvement, but for many families it brings precious little, if any, improvement and typically lots of hardship, lots of angst. According to Stanford's Mordecai Kurz, inequality is about to take another giant leap backward that, according to him, may threaten the very foundation of American democracy. People about to lose their jobs as commercial truckers, for instance, may focus political anger in the wrong places, just as many displaced coal miners are focusing their anger non-productively now. Without question, there is a swamp that needs to be drained. But misguided demagoguery makes useful responses by society further away rather than closer to people on the front lines of this revolution of work, people who need workable solutions the most. Just then, zombie Adam Smith jumps in. Charles, he asks, is it possible technology actually is outstripping our human capacity to evolve with it, to keep up with it? Our newest zombie ponders and then responds, Well, yes, Grandpa answers, we may be exceeding our human capacities to respond purposefully, quickly, effectively. Instead of launching internet trolls to make others who oppose us more angry, Grandfather implores, we ought to be reaching instead across political boundaries through stewardship to plan for futures of our kids, the future of coming American generations. So, inquires Professor Joan Robinson, does this mean some of the narratives we use to explain how the world works are being undermined at a faster pace than our human ability to create new viable ones? Yep, Charles retorts. Indeed, the way the world works is changing so abruptly 
that narratives guiding our lives cannot keep up effectively. So he concludes we must create realistic, new, democratically supported narratives to guide us viable stories about how to plan, how to face change together effectively, even as one unified nation, Grandpa reflects. Then, says Joan, I will tie some of these pieces together, particularly those connected to economics and moral philosophy. As Grandpa nods approvingly, zombie Professor Robinson, now locked and loaded, so to speak, prepares to launch our next module on America's public ethics just ahead. This is Jim Sawyer for CapitalismAndCrisis.org, home of Zombinomics. Zombinomics.